Wow, it's Woolsey. Welcome back to the Geometry Dash uh, Editor Guide video. It's not a welcome back, this is a new beginning. Uh, am I playing with like mods installed? Like, there's so much stuff on my profile. I just came back from America and everything's different because of the updates. I know like nothing right now. I feel like an absolute noob. I'm going into the Editor Guide and I feel like I'm just gonna go through. Oh my God, there's so many different categories. <gasps> so this is a guide written by Viper and Auto Nick that is officially like embedded into the game. And it basically tells you how to use a bunch of features. It says that you can use it as a noob or a veteran. You know, it's just got everything, everything you could possibly ask for. Why don't we just start small and then maybe just build up our little experience going through this editor guide from scratch. This is what I'm thinking of doing for like a little series. I have to find my way to the Editor. You know what? We're gonna go through this just in case. This is gonna be a Geometry Dash series for people of all skill levels. So we're on the My Levels page. Then we click New. And at the top, I can set a level name and an optional description. Okay. New level, and I'm gonna put this is my description. Okay, nice. We have the title and the description. Then we click this one to get into the editor. Okay, now what? To start editing, click the left button. Okay, I'm in the editor. Now I have to go into the main level settings, which is accessed by the gear button in the top right corner, which can decide the level starting state. Okay, let's go for slow speed. We can make it start off as a robot if we want to, or literally anything. Classic is the original way to play Geometry Dash levels, and platform is the newest game type. We're gonna go with original for this. Starting speed can be changed, the mode can be changed, done all that. Uh, we have the different mode descriptions, and then we have options. Let's take a look at the options tab then. Here's mini mode, dual mode, two-player mode, rotate gameplay. What does that mean? Oh, I can just start the other way around. Hello? Wow, that is strange. Then we have reverse gameplay, which I assume... We go left. Okay, no time penalty. Uh... Okay, that's mainly for platformers. So we've went through all the options. Then we have background, ground, and middle ground. I am assuming that the middle ground option doesn't crash the game anymore. Okay, so we can change the background font, the color, and the song. Let's do it. We're learning the editor from square one. Let's choose a new 2.2 background. I quite like the look of this one. We can change the ground to this thing. That looks neat. Or I could just have a completely blank ground. Let's see. By preview the ground. Yeah. Ooh. No, I like the look of this. This is cute. I like it. Middle ground... I don't know if this crashes the game. I'm just gonna save just in case. Okay, so now in between we have this middle ground layer. Uh, middle ground, middle ground two. What? Okay, so let's just change it to black and white so I can see what's what. Okay, so this has like a kind of a base and a detail kind of thing. Um, let me change it around a little bit like this. Yeah, so you can change the way that this looks with these two values. That's cool. I can even click this little plus button. I'm kind of skipping ahead in the editor, I'm guessing. Now you can make this transparent. That's crazy to me because you could never change the background transparency back in the day. So that's cool. I like it. Is this going to crash my game though? That's the question. Let's just make it blue like everything else just by copying and pasting in here. Let's just take a look at all the new fonts that are in 2.2. Okay, this is cool. I dig it. These are nice. All of the- that one's hype. What the heck? Is that the meme font? I don't actually know. It looks like it though. These are so slick, dude. There's so many cool looking ones. That one's nice. I'm probably missing a couple of references when they use fonts from games, but this one looks like a Wild Western style. This one's just cool. Oh my goodness, there's so many. 50, 60, I can't read. We'll go with font 60, why not? And then we'll change the colors. Uh, let's just go for purples here. We'll go with like a light purple for this ground. And then we need to change this to a purple as well. Okay, I like this a lot. Okay, this one sounds nice to me, the Effortless Society. Normally you can open up new grounds and stuff, but I'm just gonna save time and use one that I had saved already. I'm gonna experiment with the middle ground real quick. I think maybe putting it on pink or something, not that shade, but like a different hue might look nice. And then the ground can be more this way. Yeah, see what I mean? You can have like a gradient now, and it just makes like much more sense rather than having purple background, pink ground. You can have like a magenta middle ground that really eases the transition. I think it's cool. Placing objects. We have made it to page 12. Back to the main editor screen. You will have the build button. Uh, all the objects in the game are located here. Clicking on an object selects it for use, and then you can place it in the level. It's going to do that real quick. Okay, so we can put some objects down just like this, and then we play, and we can jump on them. Neat. Perfect. Fantastic. While an object is selected, you can enable swipe on the right side to place objects over the area you swipe. Swish. Nice. Okay. 
Very good, very good. There are various types of objects grouped into specific tabs. Yep. Okay, we have blocks, outlines, and slopes, which are all in this tab. Spikes, 3D, gameplay objects, anime object, animated objects, pixel art, items, symbols, decorations, pulsing objects, rotating objects, triggers, custom objects. So yeah, we have the outlines here. These are all the slope objects. Very nice. They seem to only have the old slopes from like 2.0 and under, but that's okay. These slopes are in this tab for some reason. Uh, and then we have a bunch of stuff with slopes in this box. It's, it's fine. It doesn't matter. I like that everything's collected so you don't have to go to like page 706 to get these blocks and then think, oh, where are the slopes for them? I have to go in here. Page 4 billion. Like, it, it's fine. It, it, I like how it's collected. Spikes and stuff. I found out. Are you kidding me? The, the spike decorations aren't in the spike tab. Why? Why are there actual spikes here? 3D objects, orbs, that's cool. Or like portals, that sort of thing. Yeah, these are all animated objects. Then we have pixels, collectibles, very neat. Ooh, this one's sick. And then we have the static objects, nice. Perfect looking glow object. Look at this thing, dude, this is so hype. Then we have the little decoration tab, the saw blades and stuff. A lot of these seem very unchanged. All of these triggers that I've got to learn. Editing objects. After placing objects, you may want to edit them in some way. You want to move these three spikes to the right. You click the edit button, which is here, and then you click the button to the right, which is here. Okay. You can select more than one object at a time by enabling swipe in the bottom right, making it blue. Okay. That's something that's not very intuitive about the editor, by the way. Let me show you. So I have these objects in the editor, right? And swipe is green. I can only select one at a time. But if I have swipe on blue, I can select multiple at once. It kind of makes sense, but it's also like, huh. It's not something that you'll pick up very quickly until you're like more experienced with the editor probably. And I can move them. These move them five blocks at a time. Very nice. These move them like a tiny little pixel at a time. That's cool. Oh, wait, 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 wait. You get the bigger arrows too. So you get these things, which is a 15th of a block, if I remember correctly. This is a 60th of a block. And then we have half blocks, which move them half of a block. That's cool. These buttons aren't very intuitive either. <laughs> just saying. We have the swap, which basically just flips them around. I don't know why I made the top section completely symmetrical. When you flip them like this, you'll notice that it kind of just mirrors itself. Same on the vertical. You can rotate these all at once. And then we have... 45 degree and free rotation, which is turned off for static objects. Let me just delete those real quick. I'll put down some other objects. You can then 45 degree rotate this set, and then you can rotate them freely. Then there's the snap option. Say I have this slope, right? And I want to put these two blocks on this edge, right? I would bring them over and I would press snap like this, and it brings it to the exact same angle. And then I would just move it into place using the keybinds on my keyboard instead of pressing the actual buttons because it's easier. Then we have scale, scale, and warp. So scale is going to increase the scale like this, just on a complete full size. Whereas with scale X and Y, you can make it like taller, you can make it skinnier. And the warp tool just gives you complete creativity with that. And you can do a bunch of really weird stuff and make the slopes like super, super high like this. It's crazy, but we're not up to that yet. I think I've probably just covered this whole section. Uh, another way to do this is to select free move and snap. I would have skipped over this, thank goodness. So in the bottom right of the screen, you can see free move and snap. So for this object, if I have free move enabled, I can just why is it copy pasting itself? Hello? What? That's never been a thing. Why did it do that? What? Okay, let's just pretend it never did that and let's just continue. Like, it just didn't do that at all. So I can just move this object wherever I want and it doesn't really go to the grid. But if I enable snap, kaboom, it goes to the grid no matter where I drop it. Nice. You can also do rotations based on this button here. But again, that object has to be non-collision just because it would mess up some hitboxes and stuff. You can click deselect to be satisfied. That's cool. You can also deselect by placing new objects. That makes sense. I want to see more about warp. So you see there's a lock button here and there's a couple of other buttons that I didn't get into. As for the circular buttons, the middle one is used an anchor point for rotation while the outer one performs the actual rotation. Huh? The anchor point affects how much you can skew. So skewing objects is a thing. So let's test that. Okay, so we have a spike here. We should probably put a bunch of them just like the tutorial. So we have them selected. We go warp and then we put the anchor point 
Oh, and then everything is kind of skewed based on this. That's cool. Probably also, yeah, you can skew them vertically as uh, there's a limit, but it's cool. And then what is this? This is a rotation button. What? Okay, that is weird. And then I assume I can just move this circle point in the middle and it rotates around there instead. Wow, this system's unbelievable. What the heck? That's so sick. So I can put a spike. I can warp. I can set the center point over here and then rotate it up to here. That's going to be so useful to create like circular patterns and stuff. And then, wait, everything's based on this anchor point. What? That's so weird. So all of my movements are now based on this one anchor, which I can move wherever I really want to. That is crazy. Okay, gotcha. And then, so what does the lock button do? Let me see. Warp lock. Okay, so this just means that when I drag the corners, it doesn't it doesn't go all over the place like this. It kind of just gets stuck in its aspect ratio. What do I mean by aspect ratio? Okay, let's just say that I have a spike that's like two wide and one tall. No matter how I warp it, it's always going to be twice as wide as it is tall, unless I use the other buttons. If I use the corner ones, it's going to stay this way. Whereas I can change the ratio if it's unlocked. Okay, gotcha. Oh, we can change the color. Alrighty, let's just see. Let's just say I've got the spike. I can make it player color one. For me, it'll be orange and it goes to that color. Then we have player color two. Nice. Light background, which should go a light purple because the background is purple. Nutty. And then default is just going to be the object color for a spike. Nice. The object color can be changed in... Oh my goodness. What? Wait, where do you change the object color now? What? How do you change the object color? Background ground, ground two, line, middle ground, middle ground two. What? What? Really? You have to change the object color here? That's so weird. That is so weird. So changing this object color, for example, to yellow would mean that anything that has the default of an object color for like any blocks, for example, like most stuff has some sort of default object in it, at least for the base. That's going to make it always yellow. Let's go to color channel number one. We can put like pink. There's a whole lot of stuff on this menu, but let's just set it as pink for now. Cool. Yeah, the default varies from object to object. That's cool. You can select custom color channels, which is what I've just done. You can press next free to find a color channel that you haven't used. Okay. What it's talking about now is the fact that I can just press next free. I've already used number one. So number two is going to be available. Let's just go to number two and I'm going to try changing the actual RGB values themselves. It'll be really helpful to make gradients because for example, if you wanted something fully red, you could do that. Then you can go to the next color channel and you can say, okay, I want this to be like halfway towards blue, but still red. You can put in like 122, which is pretty much, uh, that's the wrong math. That is the wrong math. Like 128, which is halfway. And then you put something that is fully red and fully blue. It goes from red to pink to magenta and like a nice consistent little swoosh. I don't know. It's cool. Hex value. If you know the exact hex reference of a code based on its RGB values, you can put that in the box. That's cool. The opacity can change how transparent the color is. To so say I want this color to only be 25% transparent, I can just put, sorry, 25% visible. It's 75% transparent. There we go. You can see it's kind of not as visible as it was. And then I want to copy this value. I go to the next free and I paste it. It doesn't store the opacity, which is pretty interesting. So I can just see how it looks normally. I just copy paste it across channels like that and default sets it back to standard white. I didn't know that. Copy color lets you input another color channel to copy from, but with potential changes. This is so awesome. This is another way you can make really cool gradients and I'll show it with an example like this. Okay, so say I have three spikes and I put them all on color channel three, which is pink. I can then go into this one, go next free and make a new color channel which copies the color of number three and I can change the hue by like plus 50 ish for this entire color channel. What you could do is go into this little HSV button and then change it 50 that way. And that would do the same thing. But this makes it an actual color channel using the original number three, which can be pretty useful because it's kind of a hassle trying to just like go into every object you want to hue and go HSV 50. No, you can just select these objects and just put seven, which copies number three, you have the spike. And then say, I want to have another one, just copy the color of number three again, and then change it by plus 100. And this is another gradient you can do. Nice. Something else that's nice. Say number three is blending, which I'll explain in a second. The rest of these color channels that copy it are not blending, unless I put blending on this channel. 
So it does kind of make a difference this way because now I'm copying the color channel of three, which is blending with color channels that aren't, for example, seven and eight. Blending makes it blend with the visuals behind it. So let me just see if I can give an example of how blending works. If I just darken this pink right here and You'll see, by the way, that these spikes, because they copy three, they go much darker. Just all on their own, and I only changed three. So this is darker now, and it's also going transparent, because there's less of this color present in the actual level. Let me just delete these. So I have this color channel three, right? If I go and get myself a square, just a square like this, I'll scale it up just to make things nice and clear, make it three, and then I copy-paste it a couple of times in the same area, like this you'll see that the colors are kind of stacking on top of themselves, whereas usually it would just be one solid mesh. And I think this looks a lot better. It basically brings the color in with the background of the level, which is super important for like color consistency and just like having a nice display that's not like really muddy and has like really bold colors. So say if I use the color channels that copy it again, you can see the difference by having blending and not having blending on the copy colors and whatnot. It's cool. Some objects have two different parts that can be colored, indicated by detail and base. Okay, Spike only has one customizable color, which is the outline, so base is the only one shown, which is why the inside of the spike hasn't changed color, because it doesn't have a detail option. Okay, so I'm going to cut off here and do deleting next time, but I want to just do a base and detail example. Some objects you'll see are colored a little bit differently in the tab. So these are all like very gray, but these ones have a little colored inside and that shows that you can have a base color and a detail color so i could have three on the base and the detail as eight and they will be different colors i'm just going to turn off blending just to make this explanation a little bit more easy to see here we go so i can change the inside of this by changing the color there and i can change the outside by going on the base now that's purple okay cool okay so, that was my first little reading of the Geometry Dash Editor Guide made by Viper and Auto Nick. Very cool stuff. It's nice to go back to the beginning. I'm hoping that it's going to help people that are struggling to understand the editor at its core. I know a lot of people have really enjoyed looking through it themselves, but I just wanted to record myself learning it all together rather than just assuming that the people watching know about all of the basic concepts, right? Thank you so much for watching. I'll be sure to make more of these videos because I'm really excited to get to the really technical stuff. Check the links in the description. Leave a like and subscribe and have a good day.